Recently, I came across a post about a super cheap device that had a ton of hype. You mean to tell me that I can get a handheld that on paper claims that it can emulate NES, Super Nintendo, Genesis, and all of the Game Boy systems up to the advance for less than $20 with free shipping? Take my money. I usually cover a wide range of products on this channel, but it's been a very long time since I've looked at something that is this budget. The poor kid inside me desperately wants a good $20 to $30 handheld to exist, and I'm willing to see if this can fit that role. This is the SF2000 from Datafrog, and if that name doesn't instill the highest degree of confidence, then I don't know what would. My expectations going into this are very low. I think just like a lot of people that bought this based on the rendered images that went up, I've accepted the fact that this could be a cool paperweight at a minimum. I'm a sucker for anything Super Nintendo and this would be at least a cool thing to add to my shelf. So I'm going to do a review on this and I'm going to tailor my expectations to a $20 price tag. Let's start with the packaging. This thing comes in a pretty big box for a device that is this small. For reference, here's the RG353P that I gave a favorable review to last year. That device is a little bigger than the SF2000, but the packaging is actually smaller than our new device. Inside the box, we have a set of AV cables and a charging cable. AV cables are not that common on modern cheap chips, so this one is probably using something that is a bit older. In terms of the layout, it's actually pretty decent. Barring the single analog stick that is almost pointless on this device, the rest of the design looks good. It's got a set of big face buttons that fit the original nostalgia, but they've messed up on the buttons themselves. On this, X and A are concave or have a recessed middle area, but I believe that only Y and X have that on the original controller. Let's finish up with the front. We have a big D-pad that appears to be modeled after an SNES controller, and we have a switch joystick that doesn't have L3 functionality. On the right side, we have a set of rubber or silicone buttons for start and select. That gives this thing two more points over the RG353P in terms of executing the nostalgia correctly. Dead center, this device has a 3 inch IPS screen, but this thing does not have OCA applied with a sheet of glass. This uses a plastic front screen with a decent gap between it and the screen beneath it. For some reason, they state that this is a 720p panel, but this should be somewhere around 240p or so. It's a decent panel for the price, but we don't have any brightness controls, and every game that you'll play on this will have bilinear filtering applied, so it's difficult to judge the screen's sharpness. Finishing up, the D-pad is decent, as are ABXY. These don't stick when they're pressed, and they feel reminiscent of a Super Nintendo controller. The top buttons don't, and they're the only thing that I don't really care for on this. They use a hard tack switch that doesn't feel great to use. The bottom has our power switch, a charging port, an SD card slot, a headphone jack, and a volume slider. The back holds a single speaker, which is not ideal, but they did do something that's interesting on this. You'll notice that we have this bulge on the top half of the back. This lets the device display a bit better on a shelf, but it holds a user-replaceable battery cell. It's a 15 milliamp hour cell, and it should be easy to get a hold of a replacement one in your country. I only wish they could have done a better job of molding this back part to be a bit more ergonomic. So far, not that bad for $20. The plastic feels a bit cheaper than it does on the RG353P, but they did at least apply the correct texture to the surface. Let's take a look at the operating system on this and what comes included. Once you boot up the device, you'll be greeted to some elevator music on a loop that is a bit annoying and cannot be disabled. You can completely remove it from the SD card, but that's a bit more work. On the device, we have sections for MAME, GBA, GBC, GB, Genesis, SNES, and NES. For each of these, they've selected four random titles to act as a kind of favorites, but there does not seem to be a way to change these out. Pressing start will put us into the system menu, and here we can find a ton of ROMs. This thing claims that it includes 6,000 ROMs. I don't know if that's true, but they did manage to get artwork for a lot of these titles, which is not that common at all. Usually, you only see artwork for the first 100 or so titles, but they went ham on this. Let's launch an NES game to look at some of the options that we have. You can open up the submenu by pressing start and select at the same time. This menu is very basic. We can resume the game, quit, load a save state, or save a save state. We only have a total of four states for each game, but that should be more than enough for what this can do. We'll come back to the performance in a second. Let's head over to the user settings menu now. In this menu, we can change the AV signal type from NTSC to PAL, change the language, search for a game, 
or browse ROMs that we manually add to the SD card. Out of all of these, the search feature is probably the best because it's a pain to navigate 6,000 ROMs and it does a good job of pulling them all together quickly. Adding ROMs to this device is pretty simple. All you need to do is drag and drop a ROM file to the ROMs directory on your SD card. Then you'll be able to launch it from this user menu. This is not the only cheap handheld on the market, and it's not the only cheap handheld that I've reviewed on the channel. I started this channel when there were very few options on the market outside of devices like this. There's one thing that almost every cheap device seems to have, and that's screen tearing, even in low-end systems that can run well, like GB or NES. I went into this kind of accepting that that might be the case in this, but I've been surprised before. However, when I launch a game, I'm seeing some of the telltale signs. Let me see if I can slow down the footage for you on Link's Awakening so you can see what I mean. We can confirm this with a screen tearing test and we can see the same thing. If this did not have screen tearing, you would not be able to see these jagged lines. So what is screen tearing? Essentially, the system is trying to display a frame before it has a full one generated. On other devices, we can use VSync to fix this, but on small devices like these, it's a bit more complicated. The emulator and the screen need to be able to communicate with each other, and on some stuff like this, that doesn't happen. Sometimes we can fix this through code, but sometimes it needs code and special hardware, like a screen that can generate something called a tearing effect signal. Obviously, we know that this thing can't be perfect for $20, so let's at least see if it can emulate the systems that it claims at full speed. If it can do that with tearing, it's not the end of the world. Starting with Game Boy, the game appears to be running at full speed, but I think the tearing ruins games that side-scroll fast like this one. I'm noticing one thing that might be an issue for some of you while you're playing this. They've used A and B for A and B on a Game Boy. On its face, that kind of makes sense, but when you consider how you have to position your hand to make this work in games that you need to be holding down B to run, you are either going to be holding the device like this, which isn't comfortable, or you are trying to awkwardly position your thumb between them. I think the more common way to map two button systems like this would be to use Y and B, because that would give you a closer feeling of how you'd play on original hardware. The problem is that there's no way for the user to configure or remap buttons on this device. So we are stuck with how this shipped. Back to testing, GBC also appears to run full speed, but it suffers from the same issue if you're playing a fast side-scrolling game. If we switch to something that has fewer full screen transitions like Link's Awakening DX, it's much better, but this isn't that bad. When it comes to GBA, it's kind of a crapshoot. Even stuff that appears to be running well actually runs a bit slower than normal. Not only does it run a little slow, but it also has audio glitching that's kind of distracting. There are 762 GBA ROMs on this device, so there are probably a few that will run well, but I don't think this is a system that I would play on this device. After this, we have MAME. This is another system that's going to come down to the games that you're playing. Something like Metal Slug will run very well on this. It slows down in some areas, but it's a lot better than something like GBA. Normal beat-em-up games will also run well on this. This is the only system that I could see myself using this small analog stick for. NES runs very well in this device with the same side-scrolling notice that I gave for the other systems. Games like Adventure Island are a bit too annoying for me to play on this, but The Legend of Zelda is much better. Super Nintendo is crap on this, but it was less crap before I applied the latest software update. At that time, games ran very slow with heavy frame skip applied. Now they run at less than half speed for all titles. Here, take a listen to this Capcom intro for a second. So yeah, it's best to just ignore this entire system. Editing Taki here, I actually found out that if you start a game a few times, you can end up getting a Super Nintendo game to run at a faster speed. This makes no sense, what the hell? It's still very inconsistent, and a lot of games don't run that well. What's more, even when a game appears to be working, it can crash unexpectedly for no reason. So I still think this is a system that you should ignore. 
Mega Drive is our last system, and thankfully, it performs much better than SNES. The same rules apply here. I would not play a game that's fast like Sonic on this, even though it can run with some audio issues, but I would play something like Comic Zone or Streets of Rage. That's it for the systems that are supported in this menu, but I discovered that this can also play Master System ROMs. I tried other simple things that should run on this board, like PC Engine, Lynx, Game Gear, and Wonderswan, and all of those seem to be out of the question. I'm left with the thought that this could at least be a better product than it is if the software were better. There are simple things that we do not have access to, like remapping buttons or adding other light emulation systems. The company claims that this is an SL4350 SoC, but that doesn't exist. What do you mean one of those? Those, those don't exist. Let's do a teardown to try and get some answers. With the back shell off, we can get a clear look at the processor, or we would if they hadn't gone to the extreme length of sanding down the identification markings. You really only see stuff like this with ultra-budget handhelds where companies are so worried that someone will come around and just do a complete hardware clone of their product. I don't know for sure what this processor is, but I can take a wild guess. It's either a very low-end all-winner chip, a low-end MIPS chip, or a repurposed Miracast processor like the Russian lads over at 4PDA found in other data frog gaming hardware. Let's wrap up this video with my pros and cons. On the pro side, this thing is dirt cheap. Even without the coupon applied, $24 with free shipping is a steal of a deal even if you only want this as a paperweight. It's got a decent screen, good buttons, and it has a user replaceable battery. The speaker is also not that bad for a mono speaker, although I wish they would have included a second one. For cons, we just have a few. The top of my list would be the screen tearing issue, but this can be mitigated if you only use this to play certain games that don't have a lot of movement. I think the stock firmware is kind of crap, and not being able to remap buttons sucks in systems that only use two buttons. I also do not like the bilinear filtering that is applied for every system without the ability to turn it off. That's basically it. Even if this screen tearing issue cannot be fixed, this product could be a lot better with custom firmware, but I don't think the company will allow that to happen if they went to the lengths of sanding off their processor. Oh well. If you enjoyed this video, take a look at my review of the Trim UI Smart. That's a good product with a bit more power than this. Happy gaming everyone, Taki out.